webinar with Stacey. We are thrilled to have her here to talk about her latest book, The Revolutionary Samuel Adams. I'm joined by my colleagues, Kathleen in Michigan, Laura, who is also here in Florida with me, and also by our executive director, Jessica, who is in Minnesota. So we'd love to see where you are logging in from if you have not said that already in the chat. As a reminder, we do host these webinars regularly. Our next one is scheduled for April 12th with Serena Zabin, which will continue with this theme of the American Revolution. And she'll chat on her book, The Boston Massacre, A Family Affair. Again, that's on the 12th of next month. On April 26th, we'll have a pedagogy webinar with Sonia Pacheco, who will speak on immigration in US history using primary sources. Um, and she is a librarian and an archivist at the University of Massachusetts in Dartmouth. In May, we're already getting to the end of the school year. We'll have Paul Ortiz from the University of Florida speaking about heroes and leaders in Latinx history. And the next day on May 11th, we have a book chat on Mutiny on the Rising Sun, a tragic tale of slavery, smuggling, and chocolate. Um, as Jared Ross from the University of Western Washington discusses his latest book. What a great title. Uh, we are really thrilled to provide a warm welcome to Stacy Schiff. Stacy is the author of the a Great Improvisation, Franklin, France, and the Birth of America, Cleopatra, A Life, and The Witches, Salem, 1692. And of course, she's the author of tonight's webinar topic. She's also the recipient of various awards, including an NEH grant, a Guggenheim Fellowship. She's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Letters and the winner of a Pulitzer Prize. Um, I could continue on and on with her other accolades, but we'd be here all night. And I know you want to hear from Stacy and not me. So I'm going to go ahead and hand over the mic to Stacy. Thanks so much, Shauna. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Laura. I'm so thrilled to join you. Um, happy almost spring break. This is my um, sixth book, and the easiest page of it to write is the dedication page, was the dedication page, because, and I'm only telling you all this, it is dedicated to my 11th grade U.S. history teacher, who's still around, and whom I like to embarrass publicly. Um, and I thought I would talk tonight, as you know from the notes, um, not about one man, but about two, um, I think duets are generally more interesting than solos. And I also think that um, this one reveals a great deal, not only about Samuel Adams, but about all of the collisions and the antipathies that on a very personal level will power a revolution and that will actually turn up immortalized years later in the Declaration of Independence. Adams was a fifth generation Massachusetts man, the elder son of a prosperous mallster. He grew up on a large estate um, it fronted Boston Harbor. His family owned a wharf, which bore its name. And after Boston Latin, he went on to take two degrees at Harvard. And that was the usual, the customary formation of the New England elite. There was nothing remarkable about it. And Adams does not seem to have fared remarkably. In fact, he distinguished himself over the first 40 years of his life, mostly for his failure to distinguish himself. And possibly for one other thing, he inherited some slim remnant of a fortune, which he proceeded to squander. Which is to say that by the 1760s, the father of two children, once widowed, again, again married, he is very popular in Boston, but also very much downwardly mobile. Almost precisely 11 years earlier, and a short walk away from Adams's address, was born another fifth generation son of Massachusetts. The family of Thomas Hutchinson had played a role Near, nearly from the start in provincial military and political matters. Adams entered Harvard at 14, but Thomas Hutchinson did at age 12. He was a bookish child who also managed while still a student to turn his small gift from his father into a considerable sum of money. And for, for perspective, it was about four times what Adams would um, earn in any adult year of his life. Before Adams had graduated from college, Hutchinson had found his way to politics. He's elected at 26 to the Massachusetts House of Representatives, and he climbs the ranks there very quickly, traveling to London at age 30 to represent the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And I should say here that Samuel Adams would not leave Massachusetts until he was nearly 52 um, and never in his life ventures farther than Philadelphia. 
So here, if we can have it is a, on a slide, is an image of Thomas Hutchinson. Um, and I'm not in charge of my own slides, but I know Shauna, there we go. Um, and what you can see is a very beautifully embroidered coat. I'm going to ask you to wait a little bit longer for an image of Adams, um, but it tells you a great deal just to start with that Hutchison deserved or could at least pay for a portrait in 1741. No one bothered to document Adams's first years. And in fact, we have no visual proof at all that he had a childhood or was ever young. Um, he's one of those figures who comes down to us middle-aged and gray. Throughout these decades, as Adams makes his way down the social ladder, serving in minor town posts and just barely eking out a living, Thomas Hutchinson thrives. He marries very well, he invests wisely. In 1740, he's at the elbow of the royal governor who considers him a son. And over the next years, Hutchinson serves consistently in one or other of the two Massachusetts legislative assemblies. In the late 1750s, he becomes Lieutenant Governor. And by 1760, between different administrations, he, he, he acts as, as he, he serves as acting governor, which takes us after a very early awkward clash with authority, more or less up to the Stamp Act in 1765. Hutchinson has delivered on the promise of his early years. He's by now not only Lieutenant Governor, but also among other things, Chief Justice of the Superior Court. Adams has shifted about amounting to very little, serving as a market clerk, which is to say confirming that everything for sale in the Boston streets was fresh and was priced according to town regulations. Already though, he had read a line that he would claim stayed with him throughout his life. He believed that the opinion of the common man should never be neglected. And he fumbled his way toward two other convictions that essentially constituted his entire political philosophy. Rulers, he believed, should have little and the people much, and privilege should step aside to make room for genius and industry. And you can see that all three of those convictions put him on a collision course with Thomas Hutchinson, though of course the immediate collision course in 1765 was with Great Britain. Both men then are proud New Englanders. They're very comfortable and invested in Boston. Massachusetts is really their country. Adams will affect superiority in his life on only one front, and that was in his conviction that New England, with its purity of religion, with its commitment to education, with its distinguished schools and its many newspapers, was the most civilized address in America. That conviction will not earn him friends when he wound up at the Continental Congress, but those were convictions that Thomas Hutchinson entirely shared. Both men in 1765 objected to the Stamp Act. Thomas Hutchinson warned London that it was a miserable idea. The colonies had grown strong only on British neglect. Americans had carved out their homes in the wilderness without any crown support. They could not afford additional duties. When the time came to, to oppose the Revenue Act, however, he preferred a mild approach and he toned down the Massachusetts petition to the crown. As it was incumbent on, Hutch on Hutchinson to enforce the laws, he could not too much question those laws. The preference for duty over his personal conviction would come back to haunt him, as would his allergy to abstract ideals. Those he believed few in Boston fundamentally grasped. In any event, he himself had little use for them as ideas tended to unsettle governments. Meanwhile, resistance built throughout the colonies to the Stamp Act. Already they felt hamstrung by British restrictions. You could not transport a bolt of wool from one colony to the next, nor could an American printer produce a Bible. As the 18th century joke had it, an American horse practically needed to be sent to Great Britain in order to be shod. Over the summer of 1765, the streets of Boston grew very tense. And in mid-August, the town woke to a chilling sight, an effigy of a stamp master hung from the great elm on the route into town. The governor ordered the figure to be cut down, but no one could be found who would dare to do so. One ship captain in town came under Samuel Adams that day, standing under the effigy. He asked what Adams made of it. And Adams evidently replied, he did not know, he could not tell, he would have to make some inquiries, all of which may actually have been true. What was also true was that the stamp master who was meant to enforce the act was Andrew Oliver, the brother-in-law of Thomas Hutchinson. And it was to his home that a mob headed on the evening of August 14th, 
1765. They threw stones at the windows and the shutters. They traipsed through the mansion where they found not Oliver, but Thomas Hutchinson defending his brother-in-law's fine carpets and damask curtains. When later that evening, he demanded that the crowd disperse, he met with stones and bricks. He escaped with minor bruises. The next night, a mob of several hundred descended on Thomas Hutchinson's home where they knocked fur furiously at the door. They wanted him to swear that he had never written Great Britain in defense of the Stamp Act. Windows began to shatter, and then a neighbor finally stepped in. He reasoned with and headed off the crowd to Thomas Hutchinson's great relief. Hutchinson had been cowering inside throughout the entire conversation, and he suspected that if he'd been obliged to answer, he would have enraged the mob on some other count. Stamp Act resistance only built in Boston over the next weeks when the talk was all liberty and property. But there was something else in the air, something that would explain the terrible next step. Titles, as you know, seem to gravitate toward Thomas Hutchinson. At about this time, John Adams described him with equal parts scorn and envy. He was the greatest man in the province, the greatest on the continent, the greatest in the world. He was a living paragon on par with Alexander the Great or Julius Caesar. Nearly six feet tall, gracious and dignified, Hutchinson certainly looked the part. We have his letters to, the, to his London tailor there in the Massachusetts Historical Society, which means that we know a great deal about his pinkish red corduroy waistcoat and the French suit with the gold stitching and the gold buttons and the scarlet worsted breeches and the overcoat with a little velvet cape. Half the women in the colony and more than half the men were said to be under his spell. For his part, Hutchinson could not understand why exemplary public servant service, and he was an exemplary public servant, should annoy others. And yet it did tremendously. As Samuel Adams saw it, Thomas Hutchinson had from his twenties enjoyed every honor and favor in the power of his native country to, to, to confer upon him. No one had ever stockpiled so many positions, nor, Adam suspected, would anyone ever again. And moreover, they were incompatible. Thomas Hutchinson held ranking positions in different branches of government. So how could one man, asked Samuel Adams, serve simultaneously in all three branches? Hutchinson had not only claimed the most important provincial offices, but he'd seen to it that the rest were distributed among brothers, cousins, and in-laws. Or as John Adams later put it, the same two families, which were joined four times in marriage, would rule and overbear all things as usual. At different junctures, both John and Samuel Adams compiled lists of Thomas Hutchinson's titles. Together, they nearly filled a page. The Adams cousins were not alone in their disapproval. One of their colleagues called Hutchinson Thomas Grassball. Um, if anything, I think John Adams obsessed more about Hutchinson than did Samuel Adams, or at least he committed more of his resentment to paper. The people had raised Hutchinson and his family to almost all the honors and profits to the exclusion of much better men, John Adams wrote in 1766. Which meant that at around the time of the Stamp Act, it took very little to make Thomas Hutchinson's the face of despotism. The stranglehold that he had on power at home came to stand in for what felt like an abuse of power abroad. Was the amazing ascendancy of one family, asked John Adams, anything other than the foundation on which to erect a tyranny? Samuel Adams's opinion was no different, though John may have been the true Hutchinson obsessive. Hutchinson struck Samuel too as power hungry and self-interested wherever he could, Adams kicked up clouds of suspicion in the press where he began to make his mark. Was one family, he asked, not colluding against colonial interests? It did not help that Hutchinson was also of the conviction that politics was the business of the elite. It should not, it could not concern the common man for whom he had little time. As he later told the Massachusetts House of Representatives, matters like rights and liberties were far above the reach of the bulk of mankind to comprehend. And he was more disdain disdainful yet of Boston town meetings to which, as he put it, anything with the appearance of a man is admitted. So let me go back to the summer of 1765, a week and a half after Hutchinson had listened to that mob while cowering in his back room, 
a new, a new mob came to call. This one had ransacked homes of two crown officers, burning official papers and carrying off valuables. It then descended on Thomas Hutchinson's home. And this from Shauna is Hutchinson's pilastered North End mansion built by his grandfather. A warning reached Hutchinson just as he and his family sat down to dinner. They escaped minutes before the doors splintered open and a horde poured in, tromping with axes from the cellars to the third floor. They sliced through wainscoting, they ripped down curtains, they dismantled walls, they hacked beds to pieces. Before the eyes of several thousand spectators and over the course of eight hours, they gutted the mansion, carrying off pictures and jewelry and silver, clocks, multiple sets of china, Hutchinson's telescope and microscope, even the, the servant's apparel. Feathers floated from windows, clothing turned up in the streets. One of the most beautiful homes in Massachusetts was reduced to bare walls, its carpets, its curtains, its furniture, garden and trees demolished. Such ruins were never seen in America, Hutchinson wrote afterward quite accurately. And this new slide is a 19th century depiction of the sacking. Um, it's a little wide of the truth, but you'll, oops, that's the Boston Tea Party. Um, maybe the next one, Shauna? There we go. Um, that is the sacking of, of Hutchinson's home as seen from a in a 19th century print. Hutchinson made an affecting appearance in court the next morning. He had only the clothes on his back, even his robes, for, his judicial robes had been stolen. He looked stricken. With God as his witness, with tears in his eyes, he swore that he had never, directly or indirectly, in New or Old England, encouraged the Stamp Act. Sincerely or not, Adams denounced the attack. Mostly over the next months, he took to the press, where he decried the dangerous union of legislative and executive powers in the same persons. What Hutchinson saw was something else altogether. As of the mid-1760s, when largely thanks to the Stamp Act, Adams was elected to the Massachusetts House, Hutchinson believed that Adams was scheming actively for American independence. Each side accused the other of conspiracy. Hutchinson and his friends saw a designing wicked cabal intent on separation from the mother country. Adams and his friends saw a government intent with the help of venal local officials like Thomas Hutchinson on exploiting and oppressing the colonies. Law for all of five months and denounced by every American colony, the Stamp Act was never enforced. And the slide that we just went past, which should go here, is a wildly popular um, political cartoon in circulation in London within hours of Stamp Act repeal. You can see Mr. George Stamp bending over the coffin of his favorite child, Miss America Stamp, born in 1765 and dead a year later. One of the flag carriers here is the Solicitor General, Alexander Wedderburn, who was soon to thunder in London that Adams's writing had introduced Americans to a hundred rights of which they had never before heard and a hundred grievances which they had never before felt. Everyone hoped that with repeal, the entire unhappy chapter would be delegated, delegated to oblivion. As we know, it was not. Tensions eased and then mounted, Coming to a head when Boston again proved as unruly as it had been in 1765, and when soldiers were sent to return it to order. And here should be, from Shauna, a Paul Revere engraving of the 1768 landing of the troops. I think it's probably the next one. There we go. In the harbor, a fleet arranges itself as if to fire upon Boston, the troops having been led to expect resistance when they arrived. Of course, it was Adams's job to stress how orderly and how deferential was the town, what ludicrous ideas had been propagated. On October 1st, redcoats marched from the wharf to Boston Common, flags flew, fifes played, drums beat. No Bostonian could remember a parade so lavish. And for the next months, Boston went quiet. Newspapers predicted that all disputes would end here as Adams could not, quote, bear the smell of gunpowder and faints away at a drawn sword or bayonet. That may have been true, but over the next months, Adams appears to have been too busy to have fainted. These counted among the most hectic weeks of his life. He wrote so often under, and under so many names in the papers that it's difficult to keep up with him. Through 1769, he adopted a new pseudonym at a regular, regular rate of about once a month. 
He railed against the occupation. He threw darts at the administration. He ridiculed the crown officers in America who had lobbied for troops. And with friends, he cooked up what was essentially a news syndicate, the first of its kind in America. There were plenty of clashes between the sullen people of Boston and the boisterous troops. In a set of sensational news items, Adams and his friends embroidered on every incident and invented plenty of fresh ones. And these they dispatched for publication to New York, then to Philadelphia. Only afterward were those accounts printed in Boston where no one could remember if they had ever actually happened. There were muskets in faces and bayonets in chests, enslaved people suborned, near riots and attempted rapes. It could seem as if every redcoat in Boston had told every man, woman and child that he intended to blow his brains out. Was it Adams's imagination he wrote or did the troops tend to saw wood more frequently on the Sabbath? This was a full-scale assault, he concluded, on New England sobriety and probity. Again acting governor, Thomas Hutchinson was left wringing his hands. Somehow, Adams and his friends kept the colony in their deluded thrall, and with their absurd tabloid adventure, they were extending their influence well beyond New England. Nine-tenths of what they reported was fiction, raged, Tom raged Thomas Hutchinson, either absolutely false or grossly misrepresented. And fictitious quarrels, he wrote, too easily invited real ones. I tremble, Hutchinson said in September 1769, for my country. Six months later, soldiers fired on civilians near the Boston Customs House. And here, Shana will give us this Paul Revere's version of the Boston Massacre, which I see you're going to be hearing about again shortly. Um, this was a name that Samuel Adams very likely coined. There were five casualties that evening. Only with difficulty late that night did Thomas Hutchinson manage to disperse the furious crowd. He promised a full and impartial inquiry. Adams was invisible that evening, but here finally he comes. He was at the center of attention the following morning. Hutchinson had summoned his counsel and every Crown officer in Boston. They somehow needed to calm a furious town. Meanwhile, the people had convened a meeting of their own. One thing at which Adams excelled was the creation of extra legal assemblies, assemblies that tugged authority out from under Thomas Hutchinson's administration and that ultimately paved the way toward a Continental Congress. The town meeting appointed a committee with Adams at its head to call on Thomas Hutchinson. We have the account of what transpired next largely from John Adams, who wrote it much later and with a vigorous dash of 19th century color. Late that morning, on the morning after the massacre, Adams stood in the Boston townhouse before a sober crew of provincial officers in wigs and scarlet coats and gold-laced hats. Thomas Hutchinson sat at the head of the council table. Colonel Dalrymple, the commander of the land forces, was at his side. And before them, Samuel Adams delivered what John deemed to have been one of the most essential speeches of the age. Nothing but an immediate removal of the troops, Adams argued, would return the town to order. Thomas Hutchinson replied that he had no authority to order an evacuation. He regretted the events of the previous evening, but he had consulted with officers of the two regiments. They answered to their general, Thomas Gage in New York, and Hutchinson could not countermand him. In whispers, he conferred at the table with Dalrymple and with his lieutenant governor. Both of them urged him to reconsider. Ultimately, Hutchinson agreed to withdraw one regiment. It had made itself especially obnoxious, and he agreed it would remove to the fort in Boston Harbor. He assumed that the matter ended there. Adams relayed that offer to the Old South Church, where by mid-afternoon, several thousand people were packed into the pews. They deemed the removal of one regiment insufficient. For a second time, Adams headed to the townhouse to remind Hutchinson that by the Massachusetts charter, he assumed command of all military forces in his jurisdiction. Was there to be more carnage in Boston? Hutchinson stood firm. Adams warned him of the price of his intransigence. Armed men from the countryside would descend upon Boston. They would expel the troops if Hutchinson would not. And the night ahead would be, Adams warned, the most terrible that had ever been seen in America. Any bloodshed would be on Hutchinson's hands, and he should consider his own life in danger. Samuel Adams, John tells us, was no orator. On great occasions, however, and I'm quoting John Adams, when his deeper feelings were excited, 
He erected himself, or rather nature seemed to erect him, without the smallest symptom of affectation, into an upright dignity of figure and gesture, and gave a harmony to his voice which made a strong impression on spectators and auditors, the more lasting for the purity, correctness, and elegance of his style. And the 6th of March was one such occasion, though style hardly mattered. Few shared Adams's aptitude or appetite for wearing down an opponent, and no Bostonian, um, hands down, more expertly rattled Thomas Hutchinson. The previous decade seemed to have prepared Adams for this afternoon. With tremendous self-command, he stretched out his arm. The town had voted. No red coach would consider himself safe in Boston. If you have power to remove one regiment, he reminded Hutchinson, you have power to remove both. 3,000 people awaited his decision. They are become, Adams said, very restive. He sent every pulse racing. Even Dalrymple reported that Adams had left him shaking. Samuel Adams himself admitted that he had not minded the sight of Hutchinson trembling at the knees, but he spoke of something loftier. He thrilled to the display, as he put it, of determined citizens peremptorily demanding the redress of grievances. It would always be his conviction that ordinary citizens acting in concert were more powerful than they understood. An excruciating silence followed. Hutchinson seriously doubted that a mob could drive off 600 well-trained soldiers, but he did not care to find out. He agonized. Finally, he relented, though he was afterward furious with himself for having done so. John Adams thought the showdown worthy of Livy or Thucydides. The painter John Singleton Copley caught some of the flavor when Samuel Adams posed for him in this portrait later. Um, this is, thanks, John, for the next one. Oh, the next one after that. There we go. This is Adams um, with all of the intensity on display during his duel with um, Thomas Hutchinson. He quite literally takes a stand, ramrod straight, very militant in his bearing. Among Copley's subjects, he is, with the exception of Paul Revere, the least well-dressed. With his left index finger, Adams is directing us to the Massachusetts Charter, where with his right He's clenching the town's instructions for him, as if to suggest that ideas, too, can deliver lethal blows. The rule of law, the painting reminds us, can also demand a vigorous defense. And I just want to detour for a minute. I'm trying to, if we can have the next slide. I just want to detour for a minute to another portrait. This is the Copley portrait that I think is closest in feel to that of Samuel Adams. This is another 1768 Boston resident also directing our attention with his index finger, but the subject is General Gage. Um, and contemporaries remark that these two men who obviously were anathema one to the other bore a striking resemblance. Um, though he happens to be pointing to troops drilling in the distance, I think that Gage seems from these portraits to seem the milder man. His hand rests lightly on that baton and Adams is crushing his scroll. Um, and Gage is in crisp military dress, well, as I think you can see, Adams's suit looks like it's about to take flight. It certainly hasn't seen an iron in some time. Maneuvering with some difficulty around Adams, Hutchinson managed to delay the trials of the captain and the eight men who had fired until the fall, by which time tempers had cooled. With two exceptions, the soldiers were acquitted. Adams did his best afterward to relitigate the case in the press. An antagonist challenged him. Did Adams really mean to suggest that after four judges, and 24 jurors had devoted weeks to the case, they were fools, and he alone could discern the truth? Well, well, yes, it seemed that he did. The next years were quiet. Hutchinson maintained the upper hand. Anger seemed to have burned itself out. Adams remained resolute. He dominated the press and the Massachusetts House. He left Thomas Hutchinson sputtering that, though he was unimpressive as a man, the determined spirit which Adams showed in the cause of liberty compensated for any number of flaws. It vastly exceeded, Hutchinson wrote, that of anyone else in the province. He had to salute Adams's powers of persuasion. He wrote with consummate talent. He could more effectively ruin a reputation than any other man Hutchinson knew. Adams seemed to feel that ends justified means, which quieted, Hutchinson supposed, the remorse he must have felt from robbing men of their characters and injuring them more than if he had robbed them of their estates. 
It was high time he huffed, solid ground again under his feet, that Adams and his Confederates were deported to London. He harped on what he and his friends assumed was Adams's motivations. Here was a bankrupt, a desperado, a man with nothing to lose. It seemed never to occur to Hutchinson that a man without property could be a man of principle, just as it seemed natural to him that an informed elite should lead. And I should say that Adams operated from the opposite conviction. Thomas Hutchinson didn't believe it was possible to be principled and poor, but Adams did not always seem to believe it was possible to be a patriot and wealthy. More or less inevitably, Hutchinson became Massachusetts governor in March of 1771. The town remained quiet, though Adams refused to let Hutchinson far from his view. If Adams could not find an injustice at hand, he salvaged an old one. More and more shrilly, he began to eviscerate Hutchinson, painting him as a courtier, a puppet of the crown. The true American would never stoop before a man who trampled his liberties, Adams insisted, maintaining that no one in America toadied more spectacularly than did the royal governor. He compared Hutchinson to a teenaged girl surrounded with dying lovers, praising her gay ribbons, the dimples in her cheeks, or the tip of her ear. How, he asked, could a man born in America, on whom the country had bestowed every honor, so betray her? He too compared Hutchinson to Caesar, another native son who turned tyrant. The analogy, though, he said, ultimately fell apart. The Roman despot, Adams thundered in the Boston Gazette that fall, had learning, courage, and great abilities. Hutchinson had none. His disdain, disdain met with Hutchinson's condescension. As the governor put it, the faction and their followers were carried away with the sound of tyranny and liberty and other big words, the forcing meaning of which they did not comprehend. Behind the scenes, he did all he could to dismantle the opposition, taking advantage of the quiet to remove Adams's friends from his orbit. He succeeded in several cases, Hutchinson was immensely seductive. John Hancock was in particular an easy target. He swore to Hutchinson that he intended never to speak to Samuel Adams again. The animus between Hutchinson and Samuel Adams is nowhere more evident than at this point when the colony was otherwise calm. Nothing Hutchinson complained appeared in the Boston Gazette without Samuel Adams' Adams approval and most everyone in Boston read that insidious paper. Of all the faction members, Adams alone seemed unwilling to abate in his virulence. He would push the continent into a rebellion tomorrow if it was in his power, Hutchinson wrote in the fall of 1771. He bought off everyone else. Adams alone could neither be bribed nor intimidated. Were Moses to return with a divine commission, Hutchinson lamented, he would not manage to quiet Samuel Adams. For his part, Adams wrote of Hutchinson, it has been his principle from a boy that mankind are to be governed by a discerning few, and it has ever since been his ambition to be the hero of the few. He was an oily tongued monster. He had never met a man he considered his equal. He was nothing less than a public executioner of his country's rights. Early in the winter of 1773, amid much secrecy, a bundle of letters from London arrived in Boston. They came with strict instructions, no copies were to be made in whole or in part. They were to be shared only with several prominent men and they were not to be published. Adams handled them like a seasoned showman. There might be a ban on publishing the documents, but there was no ban on talking about them. Boston was soon a flutter. Among the bundle were six of Hutchinson's letters. It was rumored that Hutchinson had urged that Adams be either deported or decapitated. And Adams helped to arrange a little charade that allowed the house to ignore their London instructions. The letters were read aloud and afterward published, though not before Adams had cherry picked and masterfully edited them. He and his Confederates turned half a dozen more or less innocuous letters into a crime. They made it seem as if Hutchinson intended to, to subvert the Massachusetts constitution. Adams tossed around Hutchinson's unflattering descriptions of him for the public to savor. And by the time he finished, Hutchinson's reputation lay in ruins. He would be compared to Nero and Judas. He would burn an effigy in Philadelphia. To Samuel Adams's great satisfaction, even some of Hutchinson's friends began to avoid him. And then of course, at the end of 1773, arrived East India Company T. Yet again, Hutchinson and Adams found themselves in a stalemate. 
Hutchinson considered Adams the most active in refusing to land the tea, the director, as he put it, of the town of Boston. We have some sense of how bitter Adams had become on Thomas Hutchinson's account. At one point, Hutchinson sent word with his sheriff for a meeting of the people to disband. Adams replied to it, shredding it point by point in a 20 minute tirade. A few words have come down to us. Hutchinson felt duty bound to issue his command that the meeting disperse as his majesty's representative in the province. Is that shadow of a man, Adams sputtered, scarce able to support his withered carcass or his hoary head, is he a representation of majesty? The meeting insisted that the tea must return to Great Britain. To unload it was to risk it being sold. And the minute it was sold, went the logic, American liberties lay in tatters. The captain of the first tea ship was dispatched to Thomas Hutchinson's Milton home to demand special permission to return his cargo to London. Having made the 1770 concession to what he deemed a lawless and highly criminal assembly of men, Hutchinson stood firm. He would issue no permit. Hours later, 342 chests of tea marinated in Boston Harbor. Hutchinson was thunderstruck. The people had committed high treason, a charge that he soon downgraded to burglary. They had destroyed private property. And it fell to Thomas Hutchinson to explain to the East India Company how their property had landed in full view of a fleet in Boston Harbor. Adams was never in greater glory, he fumed, up against a masterpiece of actor-free drama. One of the most interesting things when you look at accounts of what we today know as the Boston Tea Party is how much mileage one could get out of the passive tense. And this image, um, this is the next slide, Shauna, is a fanciful rendering of the destruction of the tea from 1789, um, before it had yet become a tea party, which it did only in the 19th century. And there was indeed a large crowd on the wharf, but in almost every other respect, um, this is a very fictional uh, version of that evening. From here on, there was to be no, resp no respite for Thomas Hutchinson with his misplaced faith in the rational, his belief that rights paled next to obligations. He lurched from crisis to crisis. He and his friends continued to expect their world to return to normal. They did not see that it was imploding around them. The Massachusetts House seemed systematically to be dismantling acts of parliament. And Hutchinson finally requested a leave, sailing finally after numerous delays on June 1st, 1774. Massachusetts would be governed by General Gage, who returned to Boston with troops, part of Massachusetts's punishment for the act of vandalism. Adams credited Hutchinson for the entire incident. The town had labored day and night to return the cargo. Hutchinson had stonewalled. Were it not for his stubbornness, the East India cargo would have sailed safely back to London. Hutchinson himself should pay for its destruction. Newly arrived in London, not yet unpacked, Thomas Hutchinson was spirited off for a private interview with King George. The King was eager for news of his most unruly colony. What reaction had there been in Boston to the Port Act, he asked. He had heard of Samuel Adams, but not yet grasped that he was the cause of so many royal headaches. Hutchinson revealed that Adams was a great man of the party. What gave him his influence, asked the King. A great pretended zeal for liberty, and a most inflexible temper, answered Thomas Hutchinson. He could still not grasp how a few men of nominal worth had managed to steal a government out from men with fortunes a hundred times as great. It was a riddle he never solved. He continued to follow American events as closely as anyone. No detail at either end of the dispute escaped him. Outright confrontation struck him as unthinkable. On April 10th, 1775, Hutchinson wrote his eldest son, I cannot yet believe that Mr. Adams will be able to persuade our people to so irrational a step as to form themselves into a body to oppose the King's troops. You know what happened nine days later. And this um, is the Battle of Lexington, sketched days afterward from eyewitness accounts. So that's the next slide, Shauna. There we go. Oops, maybe before, that. there we go. The final years of exile weighed painfully on Hutchinson. He was desperately homesick and continued to calibrate everything down to the weather in New England terms. Having met with a splendid welcome when he arrived, he was soon sidelined in Great Britain. Doors began to close to him. He became something of an embarrassment. He understood he was about as relevant as an old newspaper. 
He puzzled over his fall from grace. He hoped only to die in America. Instead, he breathed his last in London in 1780, convinced to the end that Adams, more than anyone, had been responsible for American independence. John Adams wrote Thomas Hutchinson's obituary in America, adding that Hutchinson was the one man in the world who could have brought on a dispute between the colonies and the mother country that would end in their permanent separation. Adams reversed the tribute, Samuel Adams reversed the tribute, never losing sight of the man who had over the course of decades shaped his thinking and to whom he owed his career. We can't lose sight of him either. Several of the charges against Hutchinson are enshrined in that history of repeated injuries and usurpations that we know is the Declaration of Independence. Adams outlived Hutchinson by 23 years, convinced to the end that he, as he and John had agreed from the start, American liberties had more to fear from Thomas Hutchinson than from any man, nay from all other men in the world. Adams continued to rail against those few haughty families who believed they alone should govern and who assumed everyone else would tamely submit. This unravels, he sputtered, years after Thomas Hutchinson was in his grave, the mystery of millions being enslaved by the few. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stacey. We've got some great questions that are in the chat. Um, and one of them was from Marlene and she was wondering like, what modern day analogy could you compare um, to this relationship? Huh, I'm not sure I can think of a, no, I'm not sure I can think of a rivalry as bitter and intense as this one. I will admit that in terms of modern parallels, when I read of Ukraine and Zelensky, I am very often these days thinking of Samuel Adams. Um, just when you see the, you know, when you see the sort of David and Goliath contest of Ukraine versus Russia, um, it's very hard not to think back to these years. Um, I have to think a little bit harder to come up with a with a rivalry quite so accurate as the Hutchinson Adams one, though. Right, thank you. Um, our next question is from Danielle, and she wants to know what your biggest surprise was when writing this book. You know, there were so many surprises. What started me down the road with this book was having gone back to have to have read Adams's contemporaries and having discovered how much they agreed on his eminence and his preeminence over these years, and asking the question, well, what did they know that we don't? How come they understood him to be so much the man of the hour and we've completely lost him from the history? So I was surprised the more I read to discover him at every turn. I mean, behind the Boston Tea Party, exploiting the Boston massacre, uh, creating holidays and boycotts and extra legal assemblies throughout these years in Massachusetts. But I think the two things that most surprised overall were one, how long it takes. And I think we forget this when we think about the revolution and when we teach the revolution, how long a, a process it is between the Sugar and Stamp Acts in 1764 and 1765 and the Declaration. I mean, it's, it's, there are so many fits and starts and back roads and, and obstacles in the way over the course of those years. It, there is nowhere assured that this is where things are going. Um, and to put Adams back in the story injects some, I think some of the, um, aleatory nature of those years, you begin to sort of see that this is not preordained, this could have gone in any direction. And then it doesn't go in a clearly linear, um, at a linear pay, at linear pattern at an accelerated pace. And the other thing that's um, that surprised me throughout is that I knew relatively little of Adams's character, but what little I knew was about, was, was really the idea that he was a firebrand. I came to this with the sort of very basic idea that I think you get, get from Johnny Tremaine that Adams was the sort of hot-headed fanatic of the North. Um, and in every description, and particularly those of John, who's so marvelously quotable, he comes across as this very sweet-tempered, very formal, somewhat decorous man who's immensely affable, who's very patient and prudent, um, who in many at many junctures along the way actually puts the brakes on things, um, who's very comfortable behind the scenes because he's a diffident man by nature, 
but who also um, just generally has this very serene, sunny disposition, and by no means the sort of hot-headed fanatic of legend. Thank you so much. I think that kind of answers Valerie's question in the chat, um, but you might want to add to this on what we should know about Sam Adams that is not in history books. I'm sorry, say that again, what we should know about uh, Adams. What should we should know about Samuel Adams that's not in the history books? Well, I think the fact that he is so deeply instrumental, um, you know, he gets written out of the history for a number of reasons. Some of them have, of his own doing. He, he doesn't write a memoir. He refuses to collect his papers, even after John has at several junctures reminded him that he really should do so because the entire world would like to read them and they will explain the revolution later. Um, and he comes he comes out at the other on the other side of the revolution feeling very he's, he's not a federalist he's very much out of keeping with the with the future of the country really so there are a number of reasons why he gets left behind but I think well, the greatest reason is that he has that is that we tend to whitewash those years and we want it afterward to whitewash those years I mean after the revolution you don't want the revolutionaries sticking around because you want a settled government um, and you want obviously for things to quiet and Adams is. Um, shunted aside along with the entire, along with all of those, you know, Hutchinson house um, assaults, along with all of the uh, street warfare, along with all of the um, kind of riotous happenings. And in whitewashing the revolution and making it more um, a revolution of ideals and of Jeffersonian high-minded high statements, we tend to forget all of this sort of street warfare and all of the sort of down and dirty tactics that were behind that were that were going on. So I think that's the part that for numerous reasons we fail to remember. And that is and that is largely concerned with Adams and with his friends in the, in the course of these years. Thank you so much. Um, Kelly asked a really great question. Did John Adams defense of the soldiers involved in the Boston massacre damage his relationship with his cousin? Uh, such a great question. So just to go back half a step, um, after the Boston massacre, it's there's a there's a sort of tussle about how quickly to try the case. Adams Samuel Adams is extremely eager for it to be tried while tempers are flaring in Boston. Thomas Hutchinson is deeply invested in um, postponing the trials as long as possible until tempers cool for obvious reasons. And Adams makes himself a complete pest over these months. He at one point barges into a into a courtroom and tries to and tries to get the judges to promise that they will try the case sooner rather than later because he knows that Hutchinson is trying to move it farther into the fall. John Adams could not have taken the defend on the defense of the soldiers had Samuel Adams not signed off on it. And we know that not only because the two men were so close, but because we know that another attorney who, who assists with the defense, Josiah Quincy, had spoken with Adams and, and Adams had essentially asked him to, to take it on. And Part of the logic there was that John Adams would most effectively try the case without revealing any of the sort of town secrets along the way. And so it could be entrusted to him because he knew what to keep quiet and yet he would make sure that justice was done. Um, so the only answer that we have afterward to that marvelous question as to did this impair the relationship when most of the men are exonerated after in the trials is that a few years later, Samuel Adams will call on his cousin John, who remember is a little bit over a decade younger than Samuel and very much looks up to Samuel, and try to get, try to encourage John to deliver a Boston massacre oration. And these were these very mawkish, very emotional orations, which everyone attended in the year, in the, annually, in the years after the massacre, and which were then published and widely distributed, which it were very, which essentially made of that evening a sort of horrid massacre of the town of Boston um, at the hands of these uh, riotous soldiers. Um, and it would have been a, a great coup for Samuel to get John to deliver that address, because after after all, here's the lawyer who had seen to, seen to it that these soldiers were exonerated, and here he was delivering the address. And we have only John's account of that conversation. There was clearly an arm wrestle between the two cousins. You can read it. You can hear it as John describes it. Um, but he's essentially saying, you know, this this trial was the worst job I ever had. I'm still heckled in the streets for my part in it. It was the most unpopular assignment anyone could ever have asked for. But A, I don't regret it. And B, it is entirely possible that both the civilians were innocent, 
and that the soldiers didn't murder anyone. Both sides, there could have been innocence on both sides, but not in a million years are you going to make me deliver a Boston Massacre oration. And you know, I'm too old, I'm not interested enough, I won't do it. And in the end, he wins out. So I think the very fact that there could have been that tussle, that, John, that Samuel could have felt he could ask John to do it, and that John um, was able actually to um, sidestep his incredibly um, convincing cousin um, speaks to the fact that the relationship is still pretty sturdy afterward. Thank you so much. I'm going to take Tom's question next because it was also a question I had. Um, in your research, what did you find that was possibly untrue or were myths about Samuel Adams? Um, he has a lot of enemies. And I think the, the two biggest misconceptions John Hancock and Samuel Adams have an extremely fraught relationship for years. Adams uh, recruits John Hancock, um, who's also a younger man. And Hancock is extremely interested um, in, in being popular, but less interested in politics. He doesn't really have any political convictions, or he seems to have somewhat, um, he, he seems to have political convictions that change with the weather to some extent. And he has a very different set of values from, from Samuel Adams much more interested in, in frivolity. He's much more interested in, interested in material things. He's very interested in um, being very philanthropic with the town of Boston and being thanked for his, for his philanthropy. And Adams is a man who's very definite, prefers to be behind the scenes and essentially lives on air, has no material possessions and really no profession to speak of, as I said. So they are very dissimilar characters. And as I said, during those quiet years, um, Hancock and Adams will be separated by Thomas Hutchinson. And that's just one of several separations between the two of them where they really fall out with each other. And um, Adams will ultimately pay the price for that because Hancock, who has been in Congress with him, found Adams after years of working together to be really obdurate and stubborn and arrogant. He thinks the same of John Adams, if it helps any. We'll go back to Boston where he's deeply beloved, Mrs. Hancock, um, and malign Adams. And we'll say Adams is opposed to George Washington. And Adams is part of the Conway cabal. He will use every, he will he throw every um, bit of animus he can come up with against Adams. So there's a lot of, um, of dirt there, some of which sticks. I mean, you even see the ghosts of Adams and Hancock um, attacking each other in the press after their deaths. But there's a lot of sort of mis- statement which um, John Hancock dredges up in those years. And I think that the the um, the fact that there had been some sort of ill, some sort of bad blood between Adams and Washington is probably the biggest one of those. There, there was no, there's no trace of it in fact, that was a Hancock manufacturer, but because Hancock was so deeply beloved in Boston, it's one that sticks. And, and I just should say that Adams, um, Adams lives a long time. He lives to be 81 and he has the, I think misfortune of reading um, the first histories of the American Revolution. So he actually has the thankless task of reading how he's going to be depicted, um, how posterity is going to read of him. And so he reads some of these first aspersions against him, um, which is a very, you know, just a sort of horrible thing to do. But some of those are, he reads that he had been involved in the Conway Cabal, for example, which had no basis in reality. So much. We have about five minutes left, so I'll get through as many of these questions as I can in that short time. Mary would like to know if you found or thought that Samuel Adams could have made a good president. Oh, what a great question. No, I think he would have made a miserable president. Um, he has, it's funny, after the revolution, there are all kinds of reasons why he sort of departs the scene. He he was, he's, he's much more invested in in opposition in a way than he is in building up institutions. He's much more interested in, as I say, his behind the scenes role than he is in, in standing out in front of something. And a, a French diplomat actually will say of him in Philadelphia in those early years after the revolution that he got the sense that Adams, once he is no longer opposing something, um, is going to just kind of fall off the radar. And, and I think that's very much true of him. I don't, he's not, um, he's, he's a, he had been an exceptionally, um, an exceptional team player, and an exceptional, had an exceptional astuteness about how to manipulate people and 
and teams, but that all seems to desert him as he gets older. And it's very unclear whether that's because of this love of opposition or if he kind of loses his polit political gifts at that point. Um, he is very briefly and unimpressively um, Massachusetts governor, serves three terms. Um, but there is not really a lot of leadership there and his great skills seem either to have abandoned him or to be less suited to holding sort of office in an established government. Thank you, Jim. I'm gonna take your question next. Um, can you comment on Samuel Adams' statements and position on Shay's rebellion? Yeah, that's so interesting. So, you know, when I was writing this book, I was thinking a lot, obviously, about political violence and how it and how we its its role in American history and where it goes, where it leaves us today. Shays Rebellion, um, as you know, is an armed uprising of farmers in 1786, and Adams is very, very clear in his position on this. After having advocated any number of street uprisings, any number of street protests, he comes down adamantly on the side that. Uh, the protesters, the, the, that the men involved in Shays should be hanged. He's absolutely um, clear-minded about the fact that to object to, to protest against a government that is arbitrarily imposed on you is one thing. To object to and protest against and in any way attack a government in which you participate is something else altogether. And he has, has a very clear red line for him there. His feeling is that if you are you know, if, if if the government in which you participate is a democratic government, you have a right to oppose it with your vote, and violence has no place in that structure. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question, um, and this question comes in from Marlene. So she wants to know if Samuel Adams truly stood for anything, or did he just stand for things that he disliked? <laughs> I think what I said at the beginning is really... Um, the essence of the man. I mean, this was a person who felt that Americans, who felt very strongly that everyone should be heard and that Americans had no voice in their government. And this, the tussle with Hutchinson speaks, I think, very much to where he's coming from in the sense that, as with today, there is there was a sense that an entrenched elite had every lever of power in their control, that two families essentially were, um, were had had everything essentially in their in their domain and no one else was was able to participate in his in his government or made his voice to be able to make his voice heard and it is for that entirely that he stands so um i think yes there's something very clear we can say he stands for i think he would go to extraordinary ends to get there but that whole idea that informed citizens um should be able to establish among themselves a strong government, that virtue and education were key to that government, that those were the essential items for, that undergird a democracy. Over and over and over again, he beats those drums and writes to, on those subjects, I think more than anything else in these years in the newspapers. Right, thank you so much. And thank you to all of you for being here tonight. I know I learned a lot of great information on Samuel Adams. I'm looking forward to reading the rest of the book. And I hope you all have a great night. And I hope you'll join us for our next webinar on April 12th with Serena Zabin on the Boston Massacre. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you so much. Good night.